All right, I'm going to watch this talk by Brian Cantrell, and I will tell you my reactions and counter-arguments. It's called Intelligence is Not Enough, Monktoberfest 2023. It's from three weeks ago, so sometime in November. Hey, everyone. I'm Brian Cantrell. It's great to be back at Monktoberfest. Stephen, you often say that, that this is an opportunity for us to have those conversations, get those presentations that we, we never see or hear anywhere else that are very important. I think it's been great. What a, what a terrific lineup we've had today uh, and a lot of really important uh, conversations, important presentations. So we, we say that, that uh, Monktoberfest always starts with a tweet. Um, certainly, I, I think most of my presentations here have always started with a tweet. Uh, in truth, they start with being, or I guess a post on X now. Um, in truth, they actually start with being trolled. Uh, and, and this year is, is no exception. So this is not a single tweet. I'm just actually picking a representative tweet. Uh, this is actually a whole flotilla of internet garbage that I have been unspeakably trolled by. And I'm sorry that I've been so trolled by that I'm going to drag you down with me um, into a, a little bit of, of, of a, uh, of a rabbit hole. Okay, it's not trolling if the person expressing the opinion is just authentically communicating their position, right? Trolling is just to get a reaction from the other person where if you're shifting your position according to the reaction you're getting and then you're changing what you're arguing for, that's much more trolling than if you're just saying an unpopular position. Uh, of course, it's like it's post-Musk fucking Twitter, so we can't even fit a tweet on a screen. Anymore. I literally can't even be trolled by a tweet properly anymore because I can't even fit it on a screen. So th this is a very long okay, post. I'm going to go through parts of it. Um, but the gist of it is that this is a person, a well-meaning person, who has reluctantly come to the support of this initiative that we saw in the spring of pausing all AI. That AI is, is scary, uh, and we must pause all a AI research. And this is, this is, like, this is saying that uh, this is going to be extremely unpopular in my circles, that we pause AI. Uh, in fact, I shared the aesthetics of E slash ACC. If you don't know what that is, I'm really sorry to have to. This is one of these like things on the internet that are terrible. Don't okay, I, I like that he's also not into EAC, so he's. Don't blame the messenger. Position, I guess. This is something called a, a effective accelerationism. Uh, this is like imagine that like Adam Smith and Roku's Basilisk had a baby. Um, and then they were all like capitalist super fans. I'm not going to talk any more about that, um, but the, the, you can waste a lot of time on the internet that way. So this person's describing they lean libertarian. I'm generally extremely anti-regulation. It's like, okay, are you also extremely like anti-health department and anti-OSHA? Okay, the, the, I hope you appreciate some of the advantages that regulations brought you. I'm anti-big government, blah, 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 pro-progress, yeah, yeah, yeah. So but get, but why do you still support this policy? You know, the three of us, me, Flo Carvello, Brian, we're three peas in a pod here, right? It's like we're all very tech by nature, right? Techno-optimist, hackers a little bit, right? Um, we, you know, we don't, none of us like regulation, right? So I do feel like we come on this from the same background. It's just that our beliefs about how doomed we are have led us to separate Pause and AI. Here. And this gets to the gist of what I want to talk about, uh, th that the intelligence is the most powerful force in the world, I say. And we are about to give a nuclear weapon to everyone on Earth without giving it much thought because of vibes. Now, look, I'm an Xer, and so I understand the desire for millennials and Zoomers to use nuclear weapons metaphorically. But I grew up under the actual threat of nuclear weapons, so could you pick a different metaphor, please? Uh, but then you. Come on, man. The, uh, the threat of nuclear weapons is very real, right? I mean, we're not out of the woods here with nuclear weapons, right? You got Russia, the war in Ukraine, right? You got North Korea. I mean, I feel you, right? I, nuclear weapons threat is underrated, but like, like oh, actually, this is not valid. actually meant as a metaphor. This is actually meant literally. There's a literal concern that we are giving everyone a literal nuclear weapon because of vibes. 
because no okay, substantial counterargument has been offered weapon. to the existential risk concerns. You're like, wait a minute, existential, what existential risk concerns? So I, I'm, again, I apologize if I'm the one, I, hopefully I'm not, but if I'm the one to have to break it to you, there is a disturbing uh, outgrowth of the internet that believes that these computer programs that we are developing pose an existential risk to humanity, <laughs> extinction risk. And you're like, does the word extinction mean something? Is this a metaphor? Are we, no, no, we're talking literal extinction, death of all humanity. I think that we're coming to the end of the era where you can like introduce the extinction topic in that tone, right? Because it's just, it's becoming so mainstream in surveys of America, or if you look at you know, not just the general population, if you look at who signed that one sentence letter saying, yeah, AI is an existential risk comparable to nuclear weapons, it's just becoming such a mainstream view that going to a conference and being like, that's right, they think it's existential. There's just not, I don't think there's going to be a lot more time to say it in that. Because term. of the outgrowth of AI. And but how could they possibly, well, no substantial counter argument has been offered to the extinction risk. It's like, well, no substantial counterargument has been offered to the assertion that Harry Potter is nonfiction either. It doesn't make it nonfiction, actually. <laughs> um, but it that, that's fair, right? I mean, no substantial counterargument is an, an instance where you're kind of not being charitable to the opposition, right? So I wouldn't go that far, right? I think there's smart people, and he even uh, name checks Quentin Pope. Flo does here in this tweet. Um, so. I will say that there have been substantial counter arguments, right? And you've got people like Robin Hansen, who everything they say is substantial, right? He's one of the greats of our time. Um, so I wouldn't go that far, Flo. Um, but I, I get where Flo's coming from, where uh, I will say personally, when I read the counter arguments, they do seem a lot shallower, right? So I, I, I intuitively get the idea that like, when I'm reading Eliezer Yudkowsky's large corpus, I'm like, wow, this really holds together, right? There's a lot of interconnecting beliefs. There's a lot of disjoint reasons why things are gonna go bad by default. And then when I read the other side, I'm like, okay, it doesn't seem like you've spent quite as much time thinking about this. It seems like I don't get how you're drawing the conclusion of low probability. So like I get where flow's coming from, but I, I'm gonna concede Brian's point the, and that the, the, you know, I wouldn't put it that way. Like, EAC is not serious people. It's like, okay, not serious people. All right, we'll take that apart in a second here. Um, and it's increasingly obvious that Asia. I, I, I like how uh, all three of us agree that EAC yeah, is very close. People. In fact, I know from other researchers, from top labs, who think it's basically here, and that right now we are in a slow takeoff. To be clear, to be clear, there may be a 95% plus chance that AGI goes extremely well, but 5% chance of annihilation is much too high and more than enough for a pause. What's the big rush? Okay, where do these numbers come from? And this is this thing that <laughs> this has become this kind of popular idea of what is your P doom is what they call it. Probability of doom. What's your P doom? My P doom is 5%. And there are actual serious people who are engaging in this discussion without, I don't think, any serious thinking. Kevin Roos is a reporter for the New York Times who I adore. I think Kevin Roos is terrific. Kevin Roos says, my P doom is about 5%. Why, Kevin Roos? Why not 2% or 1% or 1 one, one millionth of 1%? Where does 5% come from? And I mean, I think if you hear a bunch of luminaries saying that their P-Doom is 10%, 25%, and you, and you hear that this is now a serious debate, and you don't necessarily know the details of the topic, uh, but to snap your own P-Doom to somewhere in the same ballpark, I think is a lot more reasonable than being like, my P-Doom is one one millionth of a percent. It's like, uh, I think you might be missing something, right? And there's such a thing as a probability that represents that you're just not confident right? So some probabilities are just more in the right ballpark of, hey, I'm not confident what I should think, right? Like 5% is in that right ballpark. Arguably 20% is in that ballpark. Maybe 1% is in that ballpark. One, one millionth of a percent, you're not even talking in the right ballpark, right? So there, there's something here in terms of orders of magnitude that is a meaningful And I hope I'm wrong. I hope you're wrong too. All right. So what, what I want to, to take this apart. Um, first, I want to talk about the word serious. This tweet uses the word serious like three different times, mainly to deride the enemies of, of, the, twi of the, the, the Twitterer. And I understand that. But it's like it's not honestly clear what serious means in the context of someone who's equating a computer program with nuclear weapons.
Like, these are not the same thing. Or accuses anyone of, who disagrees with this assessment of just vibes. Or we're talking about human extinction. Human extinction. Yeah, so I'll concede the point that it's not a fair tactic to just call the other side not serious, right? It doesn't object level uh, argue what's being argued. Um, I can also see Flo's side of, of just like, you know, the, the EX people, it's like, it, there is more of that making up the argument on the spot, I think, on the other side, right? So you can call that not serious, but, you know, Brian's got a valid point here. Um, and, and you know, both sides can easily accuse the other of, of being unserious, right? It's just something you can say at any argument. It's like the meme I posted of all the Spider-Mans pointing at each other, um, except in my meme, they didn't say unserious, they said midwit. But it's, it's the idea of it's a symmetrical weapon, right? So you can't just go around calling somebody unserious. That's not a, a substantive Shit. objection. I mean, can we have a little more reverence for our shared ancestry, please? Like, don't you think that our shared ancestors from 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago would be like, wait a minute, sorry, what? Do you not understand, like, how hard, like, we, we, we colonized this planet from, from the Arctic to, to the Pacific Ocean, to Easter Island, and you're worried about extinction? Like, okay, like, let's, let's have some reverence here. I mean, yeah, we have reverence for our ancestors, right? We're saying there's like a 90% chance for we're going to survive. Ancestry. So there's a serious question. Why should we treat this seriously at all? Why should we treat the, the, the fear of extinction at the hand of a computer program is so absurd that at some level it does not merit serious consideration? It is an outlandish claim that is not well supported by any. I think we're at the point where you're going to have to put that in the conclusion of your argument, right? You're going to first have to object level argue why all the claims are nonsensical. And then at the end, you could be like, in conclusion, this is not serious. But it's just, you can't surface level Ethan. call it non-serious. But anymore. there are reasons to treat it seriously. Now, first of all, one reason to treat it seriously is, well, this could be a serious concern. Fear of technology is not new, and it's not always poorly placed. It can be well-founded. I mean, I saw an excellent talk this morning about Fukushima, and clearly there are, there are reasons to carefully consider. Yeah, so nuclear energy is a really good historical precedent for a well-founded fear of technology, right? Probably the best one, although I, there's also biotech. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the worth hitting on for sure. And fears can be very legitimate. And the new technologies often can have unintended consequences. We want to explore those. Those can merit consideration. So the seriousness does merit consideration, but there's another reason to consider this seriously. Because those folks that believe in AI-based extinction risk are advocating for things that are scary. They are advocating for like the AI pause. If you read serious uh, yeah, I mean, we are, and it sucks, right? And it's we're only doing it because we think it's already scary. Actually, what to the not AI pause is, it is brazenly authoritarian. It has to be. It <laughs> has to be. And the folks that are talking this Fair way enough. about restricting what a computer program can do, which is pretty scary, violating what many people view as natural rights, that is one step away from violence. And indeed, disconcertingly, this rhetoric does escalate. I mean, I would push back that uh, authoritarianism is one step away from violence, right? I mean, it's it's a form, um, and you know, even authoritarianism is not the best characterization. But if you're talking about something like an internationally enforced ban on a certain level of com uh, compute, where if somebody violates the ban, the ban needs to be enforced. Enforcement in that situation requires violence. Then yes, there's a general principle that governmental power comes from the threat of violence. So if that's what he means by uh, one step away from violence, sure. And if it's brazenly authoritarian to have a centralized ban, the same as a nuclear proliferation ban, right? If, if that's brazenly authoritarian, that we don't let Iran get nukes, or we try, right? Then, then yes, the, right uh, then I agree. That we should control GPUs and those who, who would, would violate the international embargo on GPUs, yes, we should bomb their data centers. In fact, we should preemptively strike their data centers. It's like, whoa! I mean, you know, the definition of preemptive is open to interpretation, right? I would say if you've amassed enough compute to do damage, is it really preemptive to strike or enforce the policy of the violence? If, if it can't be peacefully settled, then yeah, sure. Um, I just want to zoom out a little and just make the general point that, like, 
um, if you don't buy that we're doomed, and then you follow the doomers' recommendations, then of course the doomers look completely insane, right? Why would anybody ever enforce a policy on a data center using violence? I agree, right? So, so his reaction is calibrated if you just dismiss the tumor's main claim, then yeah, all the recommendations oh, oh, are insane. Turn it down! We're talking about a preemptive strike on a data center because they have genius. Where are we? Because of a computer program. And it's like, no, but no one will offer a serious counter argument. All right, here I am. Please don't bomb the data centers. Let's, let us, <laughs> can we please, 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 please turn it down. So th th this rhetoric is is scary. And it, and we you're scaring the children. We, we need to actually, talk about this so we're gonna let's talk about this seriously for a bit and then i want to get to like the, what actually underlines real real engineering so when you take apart these agi based extinction risks these fears where do they come from well the first thing is a computer program could get a hold of nuclear weapons it's like stop it you're cheating you can't do that that i mean that you, you could justify any fear for getting a hold of nuclear weapons in fact nuclear weapons like as it turns out like we actually had a lot of people thinking about that. It's a nuclear weapon, actually. It does a lot of damage, pretty clear. We actually spent a whole bunch of time, and really indisputably serious people spent a lot of time on nuclear nonproliferation. So we're going to leave that one aside. You're not allowed. Um, okay, a lot of really serious people spent a lot of time on nuclear nonproliferation. I mean, uh, you know, I just read The Doomsday Machine. I read a couple other books on, on nuclear proliferation, and um, it doesn't look like a solved problem at all, right? Which is why I think nuclear risk is still like a 1% a year type of thing. Um, you know, nuclear existential or semi-existential risk. But uh, regardless, I don't really agree that these three bullets r really capture the extinction risk because there's kind of a more intuitive step-by-step um, -step iterative way that we go extinct, which is just like the AI just takes power just as a existence proof of a way that an AI can take power. It can just do it the same way you see humans doing it, right? The same way you see people taking political power, right? I mean, you see movements growing. I mean, the EAC movement's growing, but you also see political movements growing right the trump movement obviously hitler i'm not saying trump is hitler but like the way that humans take power you know corporations are taking power right so people follow ideologies they follow ways that they think they can get money right crypto has a lot of power so just having a bunch of humans on your side and building an increasingly large coalition and having power over that uh, coalition and then starting to have like surveillance over that coalition and or having the the ability to control you know by punishing people who aren't doing what they're supposed to and, and you tighten your power and you can monitor everything they're doing wrong which is a lot of the kind of control that communist china had and the ccp still has today i mean we're familiar with a lot of ways that humans can have power over humans so imagine an ai just perfectly executing that playbook suddenly it becomes very hard to kind of rebel right so now you're hinging your non-doom scenario on saying like well some good humans will like rise up and attack it before it's too late but you got to realize i mean there's a lot of paths to power right and then eventually maybe it gets the nuclear weapons maybe it builds its own nuclear weapons maybe it busts out the sci-fi but i'm just my point here is to push back against these three bullet points and be like there's a lot of these incremental I would just say paths. the computer program is just going to control nuclear weapons come on like go watch war games if you haven't already please well, then we're going to actually, we, we land on two other things. Well, I think that a, a computer program can make a novel bioweapon. It's like, I don't think that, that reflects some kind of misunderstanding of how complicated a bioweapon is. We encourage folks to read a book called Biohazard by Ken Albeck about the Soviet, weapons, Soviet Union's bioweapons program. And there were a whole lot of accidents that happened when you make bioweapons. So we, I, I, I think a novel bioweapon is actually a little bit harder for a computer program to pull off than you might think. Or the computer program is going to develop novel molecular nanotechnology. You're like, this again? So if you are of my generation, if you've ever heard the, the term gray goo was a K. Eric Drexlerism from the late 90s about how we're going to have these, these nanobots that can make smaller nanobots, that can make smaller nanobots, that can all turn into weapons that can turn us into gray goo. And of course, the military gets very like sexually excited when they hear all this. So they're like, oh, gray goo, like tell me more. And K. Eric Drexler would say, like, look, a famously would say, a, a cow takes grass and turns it into steak. Why can't we make a weapon that turns you into gray goo? And this got people very, very excited. And it got, I, as a young technologist, I'm not excited about the gray goo bit, but I'm like, I, molecular nanotechnology sounds interesting. And I am embarrassed to say that I read an entire book on nanotechnology before I realized that none of it had been reduced to practice. Actually, nothing had been built at all. 
Right, because we're talking about future technological progress driven by a higher IQ mind, right? So there has to be some level of extrapolation here, right? I mean, if you just think about, I was alive in the 90s, right? And, and when I hold an iPhone today, I still remember how impossible that seemed to ever have a device like that in my childhood, right? I mean, I, for my first reaction would be like, wow, a color screen, right? Like, it's, you, it's, it's hard to remember how far so we've come. This was all just like, could be, maybe? This was all effectively hypothetical. As it turns out, there are a whole bunch of reasons why molecular nanotechnology and molecular-based machines are really, really hard. Is it wet chemistry or dry chemistry? Because if it's wet chemistry, it's in water, and that immediately takes off a lot of elements that you want to build your little machines out of. Yeah, you can't build them out of those. They're not soluble in water. So is it wet chemistry or dry chemistry? It's like, oh, I think it's maybe it's dry chemistry. Oh, you're gonna invent a new branch of chemistry that we have been working on for roughly 400 years and made no progress on? That's good to know. So it's like, oh, Jesus Christ, nanotechnology is back again. So the, when people talk about extinction risk due, due to these two things, I, I mean, I think it's a bit ridiculous, but they do have something in common that's really important. And what they have in common is this idea of yeah, I mean, look, imagine asking somebody in the year 1900 to describe a modern computer chip and a modern computer chip fab, right? It's like, oh, yeah, we're just going to etch circuits, right, on the nanoscale. It's like, what are you talking about, right? I mean, the, to describe today's technology to somebody in 1900, which isn't that long ago, it's a few generations, um, it's it's crazy stuff what we're doing today, how we're building things, Um and then in terms of like wet chemistry, dry chemistry, I don't know, right? It's, it's not my area of expertise, but when I look at what biology has accomplished, right? You look at algae, you look at the cells in our body. I mean, that's some crazy stuff, right? That's crazy nanotech, which you get with biology. And I just don't think that biology is finding the global optimum here, right? It's a certain type of search process. It has major limitations, as we know, right? Humans, when you look at any dimension that humans try to out-optimize for on the macro scale, right? You're never going to have a biological organism that flies faster than a human plane, right? It just doesn't happen, right? It's not going to go to space better than a human rocket, right? It's, it's uh, you know, maybe something like uh, the, the eye versus a camera. I don't know who's winning that race, but I think on a lot of dimensions, cameras are winning. I would bet on the camera at this point because we really are, you know, we're solving the fundamental problem of what cameras need to do, right? Whatever you want to optimize the camera for, um, at, you know, you want to just use a synthetic camera. Like, we generally tend to out-engineer biology on various dimensions. And so when I think about nanotechnology, I just think about like, okay, human engineering beating evolution, but on a smaller scale. That's the high level reason why I think something is going to exist, even if I can't tell you what kind of chemistry Super exists Super intelligent today. engineering. The AI will make weapons. That is how it will slay us. It will yeah. lead to our extinction. And it will not just kill, by the way, some humans, but all of them. That's what extinction means. You have to kill all the humans. That's a lot of humans to kill. So you're going to... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true that it's hard to kill all humans in one fell swoop, right? So if you want to describe a scenario where only like a month passes and all the humans are dead, you pretty much have to bust out sci-fi, right? Otherwise, there is going to be enough pushback if you try to use ordinary seeming means. Um, that said, if, if you want to give yourself a few years or a couple decades to transfer power fully, then it becomes a lot easier, right? Because that's the scale of human movements, right? So you just start a movement, you just use ordinary, you can do it through a text terminal, right, to other humans, it, it becomes, you know, too easy, right? But if you just want to do it in a month, then yeah, you probably need to bust out some sci-fi, you probably need like a virus that lies dormant in all the people and then activates, uh, you know, rapidly, or you need like a swarm of nanobots flying around the air, like you do need to bust out sci-fi. You AI you can computer program, you're going to make weapons. And let's leave aside the gazillions of questions that that assertion would, would give rise to. Like, really? Like, that's the AI's, like, that's its motivation? It wants to, like, kill us all? Seems strange. How does it get the means of production? I mean, as my daughter is fond of saying, whenever this comes up about AI taking over the world, she's like, it has no arms or legs. Like, that's a deeper point than you might realize. It has no arms or legs, and it's like the lack of arms and legs becomes really load-bearing when you want to kill all humans. So, I, don't I mean, there's two types of arms and legs, right? So the first type is just imagine robots getting a little bit more agile, right? So you've got Tesla Optimus, or just like, you know, the new stuff coming out of probably not Boston Robotics, but you get the idea. I mean, these videos are coming out of super agile robots, right? The military is building them, hobbyists are building them, like they're going to happen. They're probably less than a decade away might even be a year or two away. 
Uh, and then the other answer to where are the arms or legs is just humans, right? I mean, just imagine you have humans working for you. You give the humans tasks. They use their arms or legs to do the tasks. They might even think that their boss is a human, right? There's so many humans who think that they're working for humans today, and they probably are, but they haven't really confirmed that in meat space, right? They just, I mean, I personally run a company that where all the employees are remote, right? So they've never met me in person. I could be an AI, right? So, so they're my arms and legs effectively. Okay. And then also, 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 let's leave aside human adaptability. Let's just factor that one out because that one's, by the way, huge. And I mean, can you imagine, honestly, it's like kind of fun to fantasize about, you know, th things feel so fractured and we're constantly in, you know, in, we got all these tribes as humans, we're constantly fighting against one another. Can you imagine if we are all united by the cause of fighting the computer program? You'll be all. Yeah, but imagine if everybody has an ADIQ. How good is that unity going to do when you can't think about how you're going to outmaneuver the AI, right? We're really lucky that some of us humans have three-digit IQs, right? But similarly, imagine the AIs having a single AI with a lot of copies, but it has a 500 IQ, and it's going to be united with itself. Awesome. Right? That's it would issue. just feel like, and it would feel like unequivocal. I mean, there's no, like, war crime against a computer program. Like, let's go to town on that thing. We would take... We would take all of our significant human powers and focus it on thwarting the computer program. I mean, now that is a Fantasia, actually. Yeah, now I am getting excited. But look, look, let's, let's it's, ignore it's not going to cut it. It's like, again, extrapolate, right? The three-digit IQ humans are doing all the work, right? The ADIQ IQ humans are just not contributing that much to the war against the AI in this scenario, in my opinion, right? So just extrapolate. What if you had four-digit AIs Let's fighting ignore you. the countermeasures. Let's ignore resilience. I want to focus on just one thing one super thin thing and i want to focus on what it takes to actually do engineering which is to say to take the constraints of the physical world mathematical reality and make things yeah and and, and again people with two digit iqs are going to have a lot of difficulty with this kind of engineering right so you're already implicitly cutting off you know half the human species here that is engineering claims. and the thing about engineering, and this is kind of the question we should be asking, if we're afraid of super intelligence and super intelligent engineering, we have to ask ourselves, is engineering an act of intelligence alone? Is that what makes an engineer hyper super intelligence? Yes, because there are very hmm, few engineers okay. with an IQ well, of 80. I there are very few engineers with an IQ of 80. Said, I really can't speak to novel bioweapons. I, I can't speak to reviving molecular nanotechnology other than as someone who was who was kind of burned by it in the late 90s as an enthusiast i can't really speak to that stuff but i actually do have a bunch of recent experience building something really big and really hard as an act of collective engineering and this yes, is because this you have a high computer idea. company that i started despite my inability to connect, connect the projector i started a computer company four years ago i'm actually really glad that Mike Olson and Stephen O'Grady are both in the room because Mike and Stephen shared a very important property when I first pitched them on Oxide. They both independently, didn't meet them about the same time, independently, and I don't think they talked to one another, I don't think they collaborated on this, so I think we can fairly say that this happened on its own, independently in each. Their reactions were hard belly laughter when I said what we wanted to go do. And it is a huge credit to them. And this is like, and it's hard for me to emphasize this. This was not derisive laughter. It was kind of a like glorious laughter. Like, of course you are. You, you, I mean, you delightful fool. This is great. That I, and the, and it was, I mean, because what, it, what we were doing was kind of bonkers. We were the first computer company in really a generation trying to d deliver the innovations to the mainstream enterprise with the hyperscalers that developed for themselves. So this is actually a, a tweet from one of our first engineers, Aryan Rutsauer at, at Oxide, and this is the literal napkin that he had as we're beginning to figure out what the network is going to look like. There's no cabling in here because all the cabling is on a cable backplane. And we went from this to this, and it works, and it boots, and it's awesome. And you might look at that and say, like, Wow, it's awesome. That's great. I, I think an AI could do that. I mean, that just seems, it's, it's, it's right there, it's working. It's like, yes, that's because that glorious machine hides from you the, the, the pain, the near-death experiences, the failures, over and over and over again on the way to getting to this thing. Because 
there is so much failure that it took to get here. And the, surmounting that was more than an act. You know, I hate to say it, but in, in, in some sense, it's a skill issue, right? And don't get me wrong, I don't think that I could do it better than you, but you know, humans don't have the greatest engineering skills compared to the logical optimum, right, of, of a engineer Ex built from the uh, ground up. Intelligence. So this is hard, if I need to say this. Uh, building a new, so this is a new computer, so uh, we did our own board design, we did our own switch, we did our own high-speed backplane, we did all the software from the lowest levels of firmware all the way up to the control plane. It is hard and it is complicated. However, it is engineering, not science. I assert that as hard as what we did is, it is easier than a bioweapon, and it is easier th than molecular nanotechnology. So, and I also think it's like something that the AI would like covet. Um, one of my favorite first replies to when we tweeted out that we had shipped um, our, our first rack and tweeted out the rack, my favorite reply was reported for pornography, which I thought was great. And I, I, I got to believe that the AI, our AI overlords, when they look at that rack, they're like, oh, that rack is looking, yeah, I want that rack. Um, so I think that the AI is going to want to actually build one of these for its own, and, and I got some news for it. It's, it's going to be well, I, I disagree with that because I think that um, there's more than enough hardware in the world to run a lot of intelligence. That seems pretty clear to me. Um, not the first generation that we have, right? So if we make GPT-5 and it requires 10x the scale of GPT-4, maybe it's hard to fit that in today's top data centers, so they're building bigger data centers. I get that. But at the end of the day, once you do a little algorithmic optimization, right, everybody knows that today's uh, LLMs are just not optimized, right? They're using way more resources. They're memorizing a bunch of stuff they don't necessarily need to memorize. It's just, I mean, you know, it's, it's first generation or it's early generation stuff. Um, the, the reason I know it's going to compress down besides the idea that just software in general tends to compress down is because I look at the human brain, right? 12 watts and 20 hertz, right? Compared to many megawatts and multiple gigahertz, right? With, with also a lot of parallelism. I mean, there's clearly orders of magnitude here that, you know, one day, maybe humans won't be alive for that day, but one day, uh, you know, a single laptop should be enough to have a super intelligence running on it. Like, I would be pretty shocked if the most optimized super intelligence can't run on a MacBook when it, you know, 150 IQ Einstein we've seen can run on some freaking chemical neurotransmitters at 20 hertz inside of a brain on 12 watts. Right, that's crazy to me that Einstein can run with those power requirements using moving parts. Right, insane architecture, and, and now you're telling me that a super intelligence can't run on a laptop. That, that doesn't really compute for me, um, because we also know that you don't have to run the same architecture that Einstein had. Right, we know that you can build it from the ground up to be to do you know reasoning well, to not have to like do a million hacks to reason well, but to have like Bayesian reasoning built from the ground up, so that you don't need. Uh, Francis Bacon to come and teach you the scientific method. You just you're hardwired. It's it's your default modality, right? To to put a Bayesian probability on everything, like stuff like that, um, is is why I think that AI doesn't need to go and rebuild hardware. Like it has plenty of hardware on day one. It has an enormous hardware overhang. If only it has really hard. Hardware. So I want to explore and and with with, with my apologies in advance, uh, especially to Norma, um, we're gonna. I want to go deep for a moment into some of these failures, into some, because I, I, th these bullets that whizzed over the ear, I want to show you a bit of what the complexion looked like. So, uh, first one, the CPU did not come out of reset. So we're, this is a compute sled based on AMD Milan. Um, bring up is, is a very delicate task. You do something called beeping it out to make sure that you've actually got connectivity where you expect it, no connectivity where you don't expect it before you power on. But we had, we had gone through all of our power on and the CPU did not come out of reset. And th th this is what this thing needs to do. The CPU needs to do work. It not coming out of reset is a serious problem. And it's in a black hole. We don't know where it is. What we would know is that after 1.25 seconds of inactivity, the CPU would effectively bounce and it would reinitialize its power cycle, and that, which is, say, the power sequencing. And the natural assumption from our perspective was the power is not good. Power is somehow marginal. 
but the power looked really, really good. And actually we found places where it was like, it's only like really good and not extraordinary. Maybe that's the problem. We made the power extraordinary and it still didn't come out of reset. So we went down so many blind alleys to figure out why is the CPU not coming out of reset? AMD was very helpful to the degree that they could be, but we were all looking at our design, looking at what's happening. It's like, yeah, this CPU should be coming out of reset. Where is it? Okay, so only a human brain can solve it. No, I think the point is that you have to build this in the physical world, right? I think that's what he's getting at is if the AI were to only simulate the process of building this, this is such a crazy situation. And um, the strongest support for this point, I haven't heard where he's going with this, but the strongest support, support would be if there's kind of a abstraction boundary violation, you know, like, oh, reality has a surprising amount of detail. So if he's like, you know, oh, there's like a moth there, right? Like, or like some microorganism or, or something where, you know, the AI wouldn't have thought to model it or something. That would be like the strongest point. But even then it's like, okay, you know, those still aren't that hard to take guesses at when you're in the simulation stage. And so we stage. started doing these kind of almost blind experiments. And these experiments are really hard because they, they basically boil down to taking some of these non-connected pins and connecting them to either ground or VCC. And that's really painful. So this is a, a photo that we took of one of these experiments. This is a wire here. That's a dime. Uh, unfortunately, in a world of like Venmo and, and whatever, I don't know if people know what a dime is anymore, but anyway, whatever. Uh, this is super small, um, and this is taking a line called KB Reset L, which is a, a keyboard reset signal, and taking that out to ground, even though we knew this, it was non-connected for us, this should not affect it, and it didn't affect it. That wasn't it, and it wasn't it, and it wasn't it, and it wasn't it, and we kept looking and looking and looking and looking and looking, and this was like weeks of desperate debugging. This thing doesn't come out of reset. We have no company. And uh, we actually discovered that our voltage regulator had a firmware bug. And in particular, it, the, the, the CPU asks for voltage to be adjusted. And we have a terrific regulator. And it sets the voltage exactly where the CPU needs, but then neglected to send the CPU the packet that says, Okay, I mean, it's like just human things, you know, it's like, wow, you just didn't have a detailed mental model of your voltage regulator, right? But this is when you have an AI where it's just good at this stuff, right? It just has a pretty good mental model of all the components, right? And so it would enumerate a list of things to check in all the components, right? And so this hypothesis wouldn't have to be something that you have to bumble your way to with physical feedback, you can just check off on your checklist like this is not that unlikely of a hypothesis for an ai that's actually built to do this kind i of did thing. it so the cpu's like i don't know what's your problem i'm gonna reset after 1.25 seconds it's like no no it did it look look at the voltage it's so good why are you but it didn't have the packet the cpu had no way of knowing it and importantly amd's tool for verifying this that we call stle a super cool tool that plugs into an amd socket and shows you all of the power margins this thing's like your power looks great it's like yeah would you mind checking for the completion packet because it's not there it's like i don't care about the completion packet it's like well yeah the cpu does the cpu does please and boy, when we discovered that and we corrected that firmware, so it was, it, well, I mean, ironically, uh, that, that was one of the very few pieces of firmware we did not write, but had a bug in it. And when we, we fixed that, the CPU came out of reset. And we're going to live. Well, we're going to live until we hit the next one where we're going to die, which is shortly thereafter. We couldn't get the NIC to come out of reset. Uh, extensive, extensive validation. Again, same thing. You're going through the design. Vendors looking at it being like, I don't know, this should work. I'm like, this should definitely work. One of our double E's, we have a, I have a terrific double E team. I, so I, just as, as, as a quick aside, uh, being we are a child of the pandemic from a company perspective, and we've been able to pull the best of the best wherever they live. So it turns out I got a bunch of great double E's from the Midwest where they all have left GE Medical. They all worked on, I myself am only gonna go in a Siemens CT as long as I live, because if I go into a GE CT, God is gonna punish me by killing me in it. So. Uh, but we've got the, the, these former GE engineers who are terrific. And one of these engineers is like, let me, I'm gonna come out to Emeryville. We'll get this thing coming out of reset. This is one of the most optimistic people I have ever met in my life, superlative engineer. And we, we work on it for the entire week and cannot get this thing to come out of reset. And he's got about to board his flight. He's like, in conclusion, you should be coming out of reset. It should be coming out of reset. We did not understand why it wasn't coming out of reset. So the part of human cognition that's failing here is like hypothesis generation, 
right? So something is wrong, and you're having trouble mapping to candidate hypotheses why it might be wrong. So that particular cognitive skill, I have news for you, like, there's going to be agents that are better at that skill, right? And so if anything, they might be telling you a story about how we made a list of the top 1,000 logical candidates, why this might be breaking, and then we checked off one, two, three, oh, and number 997 was it, right? And if it's not on their list, they could generate a bigger list or like do fewer experiments than you to get there, right? So your, your, your humanness is kind of showing here. As opinion. an act of desperation, we started taking a working add-in card and removing parts. And in particular, what we discovered is that if we change one of the pinstrap resistors, which, which changes its behavior, in particular to select a clock source, that was actually incorrectly specified by the vendor. And the vendor did not realize that actually you have a 499 ohm dependency there, not a 1K ohm dependency there. We had a 1K ohm pull down. That difference of 501 ohms was the difference between this NIC coming out of reset and not. Um, and because we needed to have a stronger resistor to overcome the internal pull up. Reworking that with, the, with the, the, the correct resistor resulted in us, we're gonna live, we're gonna live. Well, until we hit the next one. So, <laughs> Nick transiently, transiently failed to, to train all PCIe lanes. So the Nick would come up, and this is, this is transient. The, the Nick is coming up some of the time, but not all the time. And when it's coming up some of the time, it's coming up with some of the lanes, sometimes it's coming up with all the lanes, sometimes the frequency is right, sometimes it's wrong. And this is happening way too frequently to have a product a uh, grueling, grueling bug. Ultimately, we were able to decode uh, the, the link status and training state machine from the actual CPU. We were able to decode that to determine what was happening but not why. What we ultimately discovered is that this card needed a second reset, a purse is a PCI reset. It needed to be reset twice, and then it would operate. Like, well, how does this work on anything else? Well, as it turns out, we are, uh, sadly, the, the, the hardest problem that we have solved, arguably, is not having a bias. We do all of our own lowest level platform enablement. As it turns out, that legacy bias has had a double purse in it for generations. And probably had a double purse due to a broken device from literally the 80s or 90s. It has been left in. Uh, Chelsea verified that they have had this issue in their NIC for 19 years. All right, we're gonna live, we're gonna live. Well, not so fast. Um, so now things are going well, and we get a, a, a new revision of what we call our shark fin. This is the board that connects PCIe to the... Yeah, so I mean, this is you know, getting a little repetitive because it's like, yeah, this is basically the art of debugging, right? And it's true in software as well as hardware. It's like, oh, my expectation has been violated. Right, so what you do is you recursively check your assumptions, right? You try to uh, put a box around, you know, you try to narrow down, pinpoint exactly where does your assumption first get violated, right? So when one assumption is violated, you go down a lower level of abstraction. The reason the high level of abstraction works is because the lower level works. Let's look at the lower level, right? And you can and keep recursing down that. So like, yeah, you're running this algorithm using the full domain of hardware that humans build. I get that, and the original premise is that AI is going to be good at this domain and it's going to be natively better than you, right? So when I try to get people to uh, imagine what it's like to be good at a domain like this, to just, you know, to, to have an ease of thinking, the best metaphor I have is like vision, right? Like when you look around, you have the intuitive sense, like you're kind of seeing everything, which is an illusion, right? You're not really, but there's truth to that in that, like you're really good at reacting to anything in your visual field and you're really good at making sense of things in your visual field, right? So the algorithm that your eye is running is just really nicely tuned for a three-dimensional visual field, right? To get, get your high level brain, like the right signal that it needs to really get what's going on in the world based on your visual stimulus. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, have you imagine, you know, imagine looking at code, imagine looking at this computer um, and, and debugging this computer, but having that same fluency that you have when you look at visual signals, right? When you look at those colors, those uh, electromagnetic waves coming into your eye and you just have that fluency of like, you see objects, if anything is vibrating or pulsing, you know, a little fly flapping its wings anywhere in your visual field, you'll probably notice, right? So just imagine having that intuition when you're looking at this computing system where zooming into the right level of abstraction generating candidate hypotheses it's just all fluent right you don't have to tax yourself you don't have to shut out you know with, with a human doing this like 
reading this talk, listening to this talk, like again, it's clear that an 80 IQ human being has no place at a talk like this, right? Like they can't follow. And so similarly, imagine augmenting your IQ a little bit more. Imagine having more fluency with this kind of cognition. And suddenly it's like, yeah, you just did something that's not that hard. You didn't need as many guess and check experiments. You could have like known exactly what to test at different times. And maybe not 100%, but like my point is, I, I feel like, you know, I, I just want to inject some con uh, some context into what the spectrum looks like, right? That it's possible to be looking at this through more optimized, artificially intelligent, thousand IQ You got two eyes. NVMe drives, we get the new revision, and nothing works. We can talk to it over... So I made the layout, our, our chain... ...wrong, and then in a two took... ...and then a team just to not pick on the hardware exclusively, um, as we were about to ship, uh, we had the week that we later named Data Corruption Week, uh, and Data Corruption Week, the, the, the kind of reigning monarch of Data Corruption Week, was the fact that we were, we, we've got this rack scale computer, we're dropping OS images down onto these compute sleds, and periodically they would appear corrupt. It's like, I, that seems scary. It's like, yes, that's, that's very, it's very, very scary. Uh, and so we did something actually, when you have a bug that's that vexing, where I've got absolutely no idea what this could possibly be, one important thing that I've learned over the years is add a half measure to the system that will allow you to better detect this in the future. In particular, the engineer there, add, I'm like, I'm gonna add checksums to this image. Look, well, this that was a, I don't know, a bug, AMD would say this is no S bug, but the, well, that, that in particular would be different than the usual, but AMD, we, we had a, a sale, I was like, such a small sampling. There are so many of these issues um, that pose an existential risk for what we were doing. That is, say, an existential risk for the artifact. If you don't fix this bug, you have nothing. Now, it's not... Yeah, because you chose to build a computer from scratch. But I guess I guess that's the, this is supposed to be analogous to something like nanotech, where it's really you know it's kind of a blank slate, where you're kind of developing a field from scratch. So okay, that's fair. Like I agree that building nanotech to take over the world uh, is well represented, or right, arguably much harder than building your oxide computer. So fair. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the first thing is, I'll just remind you that there are these incremental paths, right? So there are affordances where you can just build on a lot of what already exists, right? So you don't need your own hardware, you can just run software. So if the AI happens to be really good at software, terrible at hardware, that's no problem because the world already has a lot of data centers. You can start a movement by running out of a data center, right? So there's affordances in terms of like just being software. There could be affordances in terms of putting together tech that already exists. Like you can do a lot of damage when you're just telling people to do stuff and not doing sci-fi, right? Like you can still, if you're just really charismatic and really determined and working 24 seven and tireless, you can get a lot done, right? You can be the CEO of a company without personally knowing all of these little details. If you just happen to be good at knowing the details of how to run a company, right? So like I take his analogy and I get that it's applicable to something like nanotech. And I agree that by the time AI builds nanotech, it will also be good at building computers like this. And it will be good at debugging them in a way that was very hard for him and his team and, and would be impossible for a human with a two-digit IQ. So fix that's fair. This bug, you have nothing. Now, it's not, to put it in context, like Tokyo is not in danger. To, to kind of contrast it to the Fukushima, I mean, I just want to, you know, I, I want to be clear about this. Like Tokyo's fine. Everyone's going to live. But you, Oxide, might die. Um, and so w they were an existential risk for, uh, for us, and each one was an emergent property, not a design property of the system. For every single one of those, there is no piece of documentation. In fact, for several of those, the documentation was actively incorrect. It was, the, the documentation would mislead you because what you're looking at is an emergent property and the breakthrough was often something that shouldn't work. Something that a hyper-intelligent super being would not suggest because it would not work. Well, like, this is really underselling hyper-intelligent super beings, right? It's like you just have to redefine what the domain of your, uh, your universe is, the domain of your problem is, right? So 
if by assumption you're only allowed to read manuals and assume that everything's working according to the abstractions, right, like the input-output and there's no unspecified behavior, then yes, you can stump it, right, the way you've set up the problem. But, you know, we're ha it's, it's kind of central to intelligence that you can give it, central to superintelligence, part of the definition of superintelligence or the part, the relevant part of superintelligence, the thing we're scared of, is the idea to operate in a large domain, right? The same as humans can do it. Our brain is comfortable when the domain is large, when you can use English to ask it any sentence that can have any meaning, right? And similarly, if you're building a computer, just like we as humans can go outside of the interfaces specified by the manual, AI can do that too, right? So it, it just seems like he's short selling intelligence If it intelligence needs here. to be said, intelligence alone does not solve problems like this. <laughs> this, our... And, and again, it's like intelligence doesn't solve it. Okay, great. Like hire somebody with an ADIQ, IQ, and if we, you know whatever skills Ability he has, I'm sure that'll to solve it. Solve these problems had nothing to do with our collective intelligence as a team. We've got a terrific team, but it's a lot more than just intelligence. And in particular, for these problems and so many like them, we and I'm sure for you in your engineering organizations, we had to summon the elements of our character, not our intelligence. Our resilience. Wow. Our <laughs> Maybe the real intelligence was the friends we our made along the way with our character. Our rigor, our optimism. Maybe the AI is like, I don't need optimism because I'm on computer programs. Like, all right, fine. You don't need optimism. I don't see you exactly having teamwork, though. I mean, we talk about super intelligence. They... <laughs> okay, teamwork, it's just because your brain couldn't solve it, so you needed somebody else to help. But if you were smarter, then you wouldn't need a teammate in this scenario, right? It's not inherently a multi person problem. We're talking about here. like super collaboration or super teamwork. We absolutely needed teamwork, optimism, or curiosity. Like, why is, like, why is that wrong? Optimism. That data the AI wouldn't sleep, dude. How about an AI that doesn't sleep? Were, were you sleeping? On the OS images started because someone saw like a something that just looked wrong, like that data is not right, and it was their curiosity that led them to this burning coal fire underneath the surface. So that, that curiosity is really, really important. These are human attributes. And these values are so important to us. These extra intelligence values are so yeah, it's also a human attribute to have a brain that barely works to do engineering. I, I, sorry for the ADIQ folks listening to this, but half the human population can't work with you, right? So you're talking about something that is pushing the limits of what humans can do, and now you're trying to sell it like, how great are we as humans that we can do this? Yeah, we can barely do this. AI is going to do it better. That we've codified them really explicitly. In fact, we use our values very explicitly as the lens for hiring for us. Uh, and of course, we're seeking, like, yes, intelligence, for sure. One intelligent people. It's okay, not I knew it. enough. Intelligence does not get you there alone. And in fact, intelligence in someone who lacks these other values, someone who doesn't have a sense of, I mean, can you imagine, like, no, 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 teamwork's terrible, he has got no sense of resilience, but uh, his intelligence is off the charts. So like, yeah, it's the idea of the 10x engineer, right? So, like, I, I think that in Brian's mind, like, he just doesn't see it as a problem that a 10x or a 100x or a 1,000 engineer uh, can solve. And so under that constraint, it's like, you better have somebody who's a good team player. But, like, in order to build an intuition for how the AI works, think about a problem that for you and I, let's say both Brian and I are 10x engineers, right, if not a 1,000x, so we've seen some moderately hard problems that we can kind of solve in an afternoon. And imagine hiring somebody who, like, is the first year in an engineering program, is about to drop out, right? has an ADIQ, isn't, isn't really a fit for this industry, they would probably tell you how you know their, their first year assignment was so hard and they needed teamwork to solve it, but then you and I look at it and we're like, well, this is like, you just need a few lines of code, see this trick kind of gets you through and you're done, right? So it's pretty clear that teamwork is a crutch, right? Like intelligence does this thing that you're making fun of, that somebody can be so smart that they don't need teamwork, that really I is how it works. Work that person actually that does not sound awesome um and I mean can you imagine doing engineering hiring based on like an exam I mean, that's ludicrous that's absolutely ludicrous or by the way and i mean i would certainly screen out anybody who doesn't pass fizz buzz right and then you can generalize the that to a harder measure exam. of intelligence i think that, that this kind of infatuation with intelligence comes from people that honestly just don't get outside enough 
they, they, they need to like do more things with their hands. Like look after kids, go hiking. Do I mean, it's like intelligence is great. It's not the whole thing. So there is, there is a humanity, and in everything that we have around us, there is humanity. I honestly didn't think it was going to get a conclusion. It was leading up to a conclusion that that is this week. Humanity is necessary to understand and resolve failure. It's like, come on, man. Engineering is a nerdy skill. The most aspy, least team-oriented person can often surprise you with how good their engineering Present. is. I think we all know that. In, in our built environment, in, in the machines that we use, you don't see that humanity because it's not, it's not physically present in the artifact, but it lives in the, in the engineers who built that artifact. This is the soul in Tracy Kidder's Soul of a New Machine. This is exactly what Kidder was referring to in The Soul of a New Machine. It kills me to quote Edison because I'm sure he lifted this quote from someone else, but Edison's quote of 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. This is the perspiration. This is the perspiration. That is not something that a computer program brings you. Computer programs lack this humanity. They don't have the willpower, the desire. I mean, it's interesting. This talk is very much an artifact of 2023, right? Because like, I, I do think it's not crazy to think that in 2025 or 2027, you'll have an AI that's giving you step-by-step -step instructions how to build your own hardware like this and step-by-step -step instructions how to debug it potentially, right? So it's not like... It's not like this moment here of what AI can do is going to be stagnant. And so it's it's interesting. He's kind of laying down a tech, testable prediction, right, where he really doesn't see AI, AI doing this. But the way he's defending humanity here, I know he's gone really deep into how he built his computer. But, like, if this were a few years ago, I can imagine an artist saying something similar about their really elaborate painting and how it incorporates many styles and how, you know, this part had to be perfect and because of all these constraints that he was working under. And now here we have, you know, Dolly and Mid Journey, and it's like, oh, okay, well, AI yeah, could just do that, it turns out, and it didn't need the humanity, it didn't need the teamwork. So I feel like he's making a, a pretty there, bold prediction here. Let alone these deeper human qualities that, that are required to do the experimentation necessary to actually engineer. So it, AI can absolutely be useful to engineers, but it cannot engineer autonomously. And we do a disservice to our. Man, AI cannot engineer a ton. It's like, you know, that Kurzweil comic where all of these papers are falling off the wall. You know, AI cannot speak like a human. AI cannot play chess, cannot play Go, cannot play video games, AI cannot make art. AI cannot uh, make a robot play soccer. You know, all these things are just falling off. So, and he's declaring now AI cannot engineer systems. Our so, own okay, humanity man. when we pretend that they can engineer autonomously. They can't. We humans can engineer and we can use it as a tool. Now, yeah, I mean, it's also worth noting, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm obviously a doomer, right? But what I'm saying, everything I've said recently uh, in the last half hour of this video is actually something that I think a, a majority or at least a lot of people at an AI lab like an open AI would probably tell you the same thing, right? So there's a lot of convergence. There, there's a lot of mutual predictions uh, in terms of how powerful AI can be between myself and the AI labs, right? So a lot of times the, the doomers and the optimists both agree like, yeah, this thing is huge, right? As Sam Altman says, like, it could be heaven or it could be lights out, right? So it seems like Brian is, you know, s disagreeing with both, right? He just doesn't think that the AI is going to do engineering. Does this mean that we don't need to worry about AI? I mean, it's all right, great. Okay, so there's no existential risk. So like, AI is fine, and I should be an effective accelerationist, I guess? It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying either. And it's unfortunate that people that are offering a counterargument to the fear of existential risk are also saying, oh, by the way, I think AI is going to save humanity, and I think we should, do, we should take the, the training wheels off and do whatever we want. No, of course not. Of course not. There are absolutely... Okay, so I mean, you know, if, if once you're if you're gonna accept Brian's premise that AI can never do engineering at this point, I basically if if I agreed with that, that would definitely be a crux for me. I would just get right off the doom train. I'd be like, whatever, let people hash it out over how you know how AI should behave on social media and copyrights and all that stuff. I'd be like, all right, you guys, I'm going to a different industry. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go get a different uh, pastime. Right? I just don't care. I just care a lot more about the fact that intelligence is going to wildly surpass humans at being a CEO, at being an engineer, at being an influencer, at being a scientist, just at everything, right? So um, I'll probably kind of skip through the rest of the talk because it's like this is our point of Lily divergence is already. 
risk. He knows it's all right. Are the exile like that anyway? So like we're all going to be in the you know the the, the post singularity afterlife. Um, that's the actual world. We actually don't care about this world. I mean, just what Emily said about like, no, we're going to be on another planet. So why? It's like, no, hey, some of us actually care about this planet and this life and this world. This is. Yeah, I mean, I'm a transhumanist, right? So I don't care that much about this life in this world. I just care about, you know, like the optimizing humanity or, or just, you know, do, continuing the trend of tech progress in the way that it's gotten better for humans and if we can make it even better by removing even more physical constraints right like the fact that i have to take a leak i don't consider that optimal i'd rather just not if, if i could avoid it you know stuff like that i think there's there's more fruit to be picked there but i think this it's all going to be cut we short and we should not let fear uh, unspecified non-specific fear prevent us from making this world better and in particular steve's Laws. We've got regulations, and we want to enforce and expand those existing. Oh, um, I do think anyone concerned about molecular uh, nanotechnology really needs to read the debate between Richard Smalley, Nobel Prize winner, who invented buckyballs. Uh, the term nanotechnology actually forked in the 90s, and nanotechnology, as practiced by Smalley, became like nanomaterials okay, and care and drugs were advocated nanomachines. They had a debate. Smalley passed away, but they had a debate in which Smalley identifies some of the devastating issues with molecular nanotechnology. It will hopefully help assuage some of your fears. This kills me to be recommending these four people on the slide. I, yeah. I, I just. So I'm, these, these are not, definitely, I, I'm not advocating for any of these. I mean, you know when you're like, yes, everybody, listen to Mark Andreessen. It's like, okay, we are, we are off the rails when you are, and. Okay, and, I know, and, and right? This is part of the reason why we need more people to kind of stand up and be like, no, no, th th this, this fear of extinction is misplaced because if I don't stand up and defend humanity, we're left to Mark Andreessen to do it. But that said, Mark Andreessen does do it very well in his Lex Friedman interview. I don't know. I think no, I'm like, uh, with Lex Friedman, I'm always like, Jesus, get the Narcan. But he actually, I, I, he's kind of growing on me. I'm a little bit worried about that. So actually, uh, and then Logan Bartlett is actually a VC. It's like, no, it kills me. Another thing to recommend. Um, but the, you should, Logan Bartlett's actually a very good interview, interviewer, and Eliezer Yudkowsky uh, is that. the kind of ne plus ultra of the AI doomerists, and it is worth listening to this, if only to understand what other people are listening to, because it is troubling. And Logan Bartlett did a terrific interview, very, very good interview, with a subject that... Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I would rather listen to this interview, which I did, this interview with Elias Ryadkowski explaining how one day AI may invent nanotech and it may have what he calls aerovores, which is nanotech that can independently live off sunlight and live in the air, and, and that could be how AI kills everybody if that's what it wants to do. I would rather listen to that kind of sci-fi than listen to Brian telling me that AI is not going to be an engineer, right? Which is, again, more pessimistic about the what AI can do than, than what the AI labs think, right? So... Um, which is fine. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he will think that the AI labs are drinking their own Kool-Aid, but like that is a pretty limited, pretty uncharitable vision of what intelligence can accomplish when he can see for himself that he wouldn't hire somebody with an ADIQ, he wouldn't hire any species of ape besides human, he wouldn't hire any lizard, right? He would only hire the upper echelon of human intelligence, and he, he just can't see past it to what the next echelon of intelligence can do. As if this 12-watt piece of meat with moving parts is just the best engineer that this universe is going to see. I have a hard time interviewing Cooley. Um, and then I would also, uh, we, we do a weekly podcast, which is a lot of fun. Rachel's been on it. It's been great. Steven's been on it. It's been a lot of fun. And we picked up a couple of these episodes, um, but in particular, if you want more details on all of the failure that we have had at Oxide and all of the humanity that we have in our own engineering. And with that, thank you very much. Okay, great. Yeah, so... I don't know if I need a closing statement, right? It's we kind of identified the crux. Like he just doesn't think AI yeah, could be an engineer because engineering was so hard and he faced so many emergent problems and so many violations of layers of abstraction. It's like, yeah, that's what intelligence is and AIs are going to have it, right? It's not limited to the human brain. All right, peace.